I recently got back from my first through hike. I did the GR11. It's a 500 mile hike across Spain from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean. But in this video, I'm answering some questions that came through to me on Instagram. Just general things you need to know if you're thinking about doing the GR11 or similar through hikes. Let's get into it. So the first question was, did you go through the HRP as well, or did you only stick to the GR11? Well, for those who don't know, the Hort Route Pyrenees, the HRP, is another through hike that goes along the same lines from the Mediterranean, but it's the Hort Route, meaning that it stays quite high through the mountains. The difference with that is the GR11 goes down into every single valley and then over a high pass. So it's a lot of down and a lot of up. There is certain sections where the HRP and the GR11 combine. So obviously I did those. And I really had a solid think about <laughs> skipping over to the HRP just to avoid a couple of those big deep valleys. But I ended up staying on the GR11 the whole time. What frustrated you most about the trail design? Easily the most frustrating thing about the trail design is that it goes from the very bottom of the valley to the higher cold every single day. I'm knowing that you're at the high pass and that you've got to go straight back down to the bottom of the valley again, it plays on you. After you know doing that 20 or 30 times, you start to get very mentally tired. But I knew that going into this trip, I knew it was going to be difficult in terms of ascent and descent. But because I was mentally prepared for that, I think it was okay. The next question was a cliche one, best moments and worst moments. I think the best moment for me was the first day, like getting down to the Atlantic, having the whole trip ahead of me, not really knowing what's coming, that, that sense of excitement that I felt and, and just the joy that I had in that moment that I had, wow, I've got like a month to just walk. That was the best moment for me. Apart from that, I really enjoyed uh, camping at Refugio Goris on top of this beautiful kind of plateau sitting above Odessa Canyon and watching the sunset and cooking dinner. That was probably one of the best moments as well. In terms of the worst moments, there were very few. I guess I just have to say the day where it just rained a lot incessantly uh, and I got quite wet, that wasn't too enjoyable. That was also a really, really tough long day. I think that was like a 40 kilometer day or something. So that one was pretty rough. But outside of that, very few bad moments. I had a question from Colin who asked, when do aches and pains become cause to stop on such a through hike? I'm not sure if he means stop permanently or just stop for a short amount of time. That's a tough question to ask, but I think the important thing to understand there is the, the line, which is often very fine, between discomfort and pain. And that is why training helps. Training helps you understand that discomfort pain line a little bit. Uh, more information around this would be, you know, sharp piercing pain. If you're experiencing that in the bottom of your feet, you've probably got plantar fasciitis. You need to manage that along the way. And I've got the mountain proof ankles routine. I think you should definitely check that out if you're worried about plantar fasciitis and understanding how to treat that. It's something that can be very common. If you have pain in your knees, more than likely, you'll need to, again, do some trail maintenance. And I've got a whole video where I actually helped my buddy Kareem. He had some pretty severe knee pain and we managed to fix that on trail. So again, go and check that video out. I'll put it in the link in the description when it's done. And the final thing I'll say about this is if the pain is cumulatively getting worse, like day after day after day, and then it's, you haven't found a way to manage that or get around that pain, and you're constantly like dosing yourself with more and more painkillers like Kareem was, then I think that that's a good time to, to really weigh up your options and consider the pros and cons and make the decision from there. But I guess that's a tough question and it's gonna be different for each situation and every person, but I hope that helps, Colin. Tracy asks, uh, are you stiff and sore after your hike? If so, what exercises did you do? Yeah, towards the end of the, those 30 days, I was starting to get pretty sore. Uh, if you think about a through hike, like a standard training month, I like to structure my training months or my training phases up to six weeks. And after that six weeks, I would have a deload week or a rest week. So that is your chance for the body to actually recover, to rebuild that 
uh, broken muscle to rebuild your system and to make you stronger again. Now I did 30 days in a row which were all pretty demanding. I had no zero days and so I had no real chance for my body to, uh, to adapt and recover. So towards the end of the trip my body was I guess really starting to suffer a little bit because it needed that deload week, it needed that chance to rebuild that it wasn't getting. And I filmed my stretching routine which you can check out, I'll link it here when it's published. This was my, my trail maintenance, this is what I did to just keep my body as fresh and as supple as I possibly could along the way. So. Some of those exercises included stretching the bottom of my feet, my plantar fascia, uh, stretching my glute med and my hamstrings, and just staying as, as loose and as supple as I could in my body. I would sit in those positions and stretch while, whilst I was cooking and whilst I was journaling at night just to give my body the opportunity to loosen up at the end of the day. And uh, I'm really, really happy that I was able to do that. And I think that's part of what kept me being able to do pretty decent miles most days and be able to continue to do that for the time that I did. Haiku Lauf asks, any uh, issues camping at night, uh, animals or farmers? No, not for me. I mean, there's a general rule in the Pyrenees that if you're above a certain height, like 1800 meters or 2000 meters, you can basically camp wherever you want. Having said that, there was definitely times where I camped below that level, but I didn't experience any issues. I remember one time in particular where I jumped the fence into a, into a probably farming private property and I set up my tent but I did that basically at sunset and I was gone at sunrise. So I cleaned up, I left the place better than I found it. So that's kind of the main thing. Animals, no issues at all. Uh, I guess that's part and parcel of, you know, people living in the Pyrenees since medieval times. The animals are just either non-existent or pretty used to humans and not bothered by it. There was one really special moment where I came across uh, a herd of deer right towards the end of the trip around Nuria really beautiful to see these wild deer kind of enjoying the mountains and just grazing and hanging out in the high mountains. That was a really nice moment. I had a question from Jose, I'm wondering about the places you stopped to sleep. I spent almost every single night wild camping. When I wasn't wild camping, I was in an actual paid campground and usually you would pay 10 euros and you put up your tent and it's totally worth it. You have hot showers, you've got kitchen facilities. So I really needed those campgrounds every sort of four to five days. Outside of that, there is refugees or refuge cabins where you'll pay from 30 to $40 a night. Often breakfast and dinner was included in that. And that was again, another opportunity to have a shower, sleep in a, in a bed and rest up and, and move on the next day. But for the most part, I was wild camping or using campgrounds down in town. So I had a question about daily routines. So when I would start, when I would end, what breaks I would have and campsite selection. That's a big question, so we'll break it down. I usually would uh, get up at about seven o'clock, sometimes 6.30, and uh, I would spend about an hour just kind of chilling, uh, making breakfast, slowly packing my gear up, not really being in too much of a rush. Towards the end of the trip, when I was doing much bigger miles, that was basically just like wake up at six, start walking as early as possible, hike, 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 often until sunset, and then setting up my tent and having very little opportunity for rest throughout the day. And the last part of that question in terms of campsite selection, <laughs> I made purposefully made one really risky campsite and that's because I wanted to get uh, what I thought would be a pretty amazing photo in, in this location here and uh, that was a very exposed campsite. It was at about 2,800 meters, basically right on the top of a coal and I knew I was going to have a rough <laughs> windy night and I didn't get a lot of sleep. So at the tops of the mountains where it tends to be very exposed, that's where you want to avoid. But you also want to avoid the bottom of the valley or anywhere near lakes or rivers. You're going to wake up with probably a wet tent and condensation on the inside. So I would try to generally camp halfway between the bottom of the valley and the top of the mountain. 
and find somewhere sheltered, whether it's a rock wall or some kind of cave or a forest, somewhere that's gonna be offering me a little bit extra protection. I had a couple of questions about guides and navigation along the way in terms of what I used. I ended up using Locus Maps, which is free. You can uh, download it if you have an Android. It's not on iPhone, unfortunately. And outside of that, I used the Cicerone guide for the GR11 uh, written by Brian Johnson. That was super valuable. I wouldn't do the trail without that guidebook. I think yeah, that it would just make things unnecessarily difficult. You can just get it on, uh, on your phone as like an ebook, and that was really handy as well. Next question I had was about food. Curious about food, what did you take with you and how much? How do you make sure that you top up your supplies along the way? Basically along the GR11, you'll pass through a town almost every single day. Uh, there are certain sections where you don't pass a town for maybe three or four days. So before you do those sections, you've just got to think out the head a little bit and plan what you're going to bring during that time. So for me, most of the food that I ate was pasta dishes, lentils, I did try a ramen bomb, <laughs> but yeah, a lot of like simple basic food. And I would generally make sure that I had three days worth of food with me, just like an emergency supply. And then I would always have, you know, loads of trail mix. I would have muesli bars. In terms of breakfast, I had the same thing every day. Oats mixed with chia seeds, chocolate, cacao powder that I mixed in with that, some dried fruit, nuts and I would just add water to that, either in the morning or sometimes the night before, cold soak it. What about second breakfast? I would stop and have a coffee, and usually you can't buy like a croissant or something for breakfast, kind of luxury. So whilst I would love to tell you that I survive exclusively on a diet of lentils, nuts and seeds and fruit, that is not the case. I was snacking like a motherfucker. It was not healthy at all. <laughs> So sadly, a lot of the time I ended up eating uh, total junk, which is definitely not something I recommend, but something you sometimes have to do because of limited access to food, but also because you need calories of calories and calories and calories. I mean, definitely towards the end, I probably would have been tipping the scales toward 4,000 calories. One bad thing about being on the trail is that I, there was a lot of comments that I just couldn't get around to. So if I haven't answered your question, I am sorry. I one day hopefully will get into it. If you do enjoy my content, please like the video. That really helps. I don't have a Patreon or anything like that. I guess my version of Patreon is just like buying elements. It's a $10 program and that really, that gets you on my mailing list and it helps. So that's about it for this video, guys. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you and uh, get out there, keep hiking, keep climbing. I'll see you on the summit.